Praise God. Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of your dear Son, Jesus. Father God, we thank you for the course we're studying on Christian living. We thank you, Father God, that uh, uh, living as a Christian is something that Christ gave us, the anointing, the, the fact that he took our, our uh, sins and iniquities, Father God, though he bore our stripes and upon his back. Uh, and Father God, that through him we are well able to carry what the world throws at us, to, to stand against the devil, Father God, and not only that, but to be even raised victorious, Father God, and, and eventually and ultimately live the way that you want us to, Lord. We thank you for your leading and direction, Father God, in the uh, class today, Father God, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, just for your anointing on the Word for me and for uh, Pastor James and Pastor Jimmy later on today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, last week we were talking a little bit about just uh, the glory of God being upon the, uh, the Christian believer to such a point that um, their faith interacts with God daily. They have a relationship that's so strong it can't be shaken. And that ultimately God wants us to live as if there's nothing wrong. That we can overcome any, any kind of situation, any kind of uh, problem, any kind of attack that the enemy throws at us. And that ultimately we'll be able to overcome these things because we have a relationship with God and that anointing the, uh, the gifts and the responsibilities that he's given to us as believers just overwhelm what the enemy tries to throw at us. That he's given us every provision that we could possibly need here on this planet, and so much so that there's an overflow that we can share it with others, and they can see it demonstrate in their own lives as well. So uh, we're going to talk today about the power of words, though. Now, this is not a, a, a legalism thing. This is not a condemnation thing. And yeah, we're going to touch on some things that sometimes we say words we're not supposed to. But I'm also going to share why this is actually something that uh, is beneficial to a Christian uh, believer that understands the power of words. The Bible talks about in many places about the power of a tongue, how it's like the, the rudder of a ship. And that even though it's a small little thing in the water, but it can steer a great ship. You look at some of the ships that they have out there, the, uh, the cargo ships. And yeah, there's this massive ship, huge propellers, but there'll just be this one little rudder in the back there that'll steer the whole thing. And so a rudder is a powerful thing, and so is the tongue in a Christian believer. And so the Bible talk, talks about it in several places, in several ways. And so this is not legalism. This, I'm, not, I'm not picking on anybody, but I do want you to know that your words do have power over your life, especially if you engage faith with them. So this is, this is not a... Uh, a situation where you have to correct every single word and every single negative thing you ever say, but to make you aware of the things that you say and that you will be able to speak faith over yourself. Does it make sense? Okay. Uh, sometimes people think that, oh, oh, I spoke negatively over something or somebody's situation, you know, I bind those words. And, you know, unless you put faith to it, you, you don't really have to worry about that sort of situation. But the Bible also does say that eventually we're going to give account of every single word that we ever spoke. But ultimately, if we speak faith and life and truth and the fact that we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we still have grace anyway. So we're going to make mistakes. We all do that. So, uh, so don't get the legalism side of things in this. Just hear the importance of this. If that's, that's what I'm trying to get at here. So if we want to start seeing the power of God manifest in our own lives, we'll have to start paying attention to what we say. Words have power. If you don't think they do, go to anybody who looks like they're having a miserable day and speak something even more miserable over them. Man, you're just going to crush their spirits even more. They're going to get upset. You can cause people to cry at a drop of a hat sometimes. They say sticks and stones won't, won't uh, uh, break my bones, but, you know, words will never hurt me. You know, but the, the truth of the matter is words affect people. They, they affect self-esteem, uh, parents talking over their children, uh, children with their friends. Words have power. And that's not even talking about the spiritual side of things yet. Uh, words have power more than any of us realize, but we often speak them as though they're meaningless. Because of that, most believers at one time or another have been hung by their tongue. I know this last couple of weeks and just a normal conversation with people and just something comes out the wrong way and I'm having to apologize all of a sudden just because I didn't even mean it the way they took it, but all of a sudden they took it the way I didn't mean it and I'm having to apologize for something I had no intention to say anyway, but they heard something completely different. With the same amount of words, 
they, they say that uh, the English language is one of the worst languages to actually speak in because there's so many words that can mean so many things, where in other languages, words mean very specific things. Uh, and, and Greek, there's what, five different words for love, you know, because there's different intentions. There's, there's friendship, there's uh, companionship, there's uh, romance, there's all these connotations, but in English, we just say love, one word. Well, how can that be taken? You know, you can take it so many ways. So, Matthew 12, 36 through 37 says, But I say unto you, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof on the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be judged, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now, this is not about condemnation against the believer, but the fact that ultimately our words have meaning. Now, when this is a non-believer before God, and they say, Oh, I don't believe in that Jesus stuff. Well, it's by their words they're going to be condemned. They, they had an opportunity, a, a Christian witness to them, and they, by their own words, condemned themselves. They may not have fully intended to do that, but ultimately, Jesus even says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Words have power. Every idle word simply means non-productive. These are words that you speak that you don't believe. For example, you might be saying, I'm dying to see my grandchildren. You don't really mean that you're dying, but you say it anyway to emphasize the importance of the relationship. And it's something we confess over ourselves without even realizing it. And again, we're not talking about legalism and condemnation here. But every time you say things that you don't really mean, it begins to numb your heart. You don't, let, me, let me explain this. I lived in Ireland. I love the Irish people. But they love cursing and using the name of J.C. every single sentence. If it's a bad weather, blankety, blankety, blank, Jesus, blah, blah, blank, blank, blank. They use the name of Jesus repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. And then when you as a Christian come up and say, Hi, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. Well, they've already worn out that name so many times in their own conversation. It, it barely means anything to them. They don't understand the person behind it. They don't understand the, the power behind it. It means nothing. And I also find it curious that they never use the name of Buddha or Muhammad when they're swearing. It's always Jesus that they're trying to wear out the name of. <clears throat> so unconsciously, each idle word is making it just a little harder for, uh, for them to believe what you say, uh, for you to believe what you say, and actually come to pass when you mean it and it really counts. Jesus understood the power of words. He used them to change the natural things around him. Mark eleven thirteen 13 through 14 and then 20 through 24 says, And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, and happily he uh, might find uh, anything therein. And then he came, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Jesus answered and said to it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. His disciples heard, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter, calling remembrance, says unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which you cursed and is withered away. Jesus answered and him, said, have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, it shall not, and shall not doubt in his heart, he shall believe those things which he had said shall come to pass, and whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive it, and you shall have them. Now, this isn't a, a name it and claim it type sermon, but it is a uh, faith it into reality type sermon. Uh, what I mean by that is the fact that your words have the ability to interact with something in your spirit, man, that even scientists don't fully understand, that when you pray for the sick and they see them healed, they think, oh, well, the power of medicine, okay, well, we actually stopped giving them medicine, so what healed them? Okay, well, it might have had a, a slow effect. You know, when a Christian goes in and intersects a situation, science doesn't understand how come faith and praying, laying on the hands actually works. But in that situation, you're speaking over somebody, you're, you're interacting with their spirit, and your faith is actually interacting. Faith is like a muscle that you can't see. It's like an arm that can stretch into the unseen, grab a hold of something that's a promise, and then pull it into reality. And science doesn't understand it. They have a concept of it. They've done studies on it. But I also know every single time they do the studies, they don't use Christians. They always use uh, New Age you know, healers and uh, crystal meditation and all this nonsense. And all of a sudden, it doesn't work for them. Oh, that proves it doesn't work. They don't want to interact with Christians that actually believe this sort of thing and see it come to pass because then all of a sudden, there'll be scientific evidence that there's something real going on. They've done numerous studies, but never in the life of a Christian. So anyway, I say all that to say this, is that uh, Jesus talking about the fig tree was looking for fruit. You have to realize that the fruit that Jesus is looking for from you and me is what he's talking about in the next thing when you have obstacles in your life, when you have a situation in your life, and it seems tremendous, and you can't possibly cross this mountain, you can't get it out of your way, you have the ability built in within you as a Christian, as a believer, to say to that mountain, 
be thou removed, cast into the sea. And it has to obey you. Nothing wavering, no doubting in your heart, and just do it. And you don't even have to do it continuously. You can even just, just do it one time and just leave it to God. Why? Because your words have gone out there for the right reasons, and I'm awake. Your words have gone out there for the right reasons, and it's going to interact with the environment, with the situation, and with things around you. And that's what you have to realize is that you don't even fully have to comprehend how it's going to happen. I've been in so many situations where all of a sudden I just felt, felt I was facing something insurmountable and couldn't possibly get around the situation. And then I said, you know what? In Jesus' name, mountain, you problem, you situation, you get out of here. You leave now. Get out of here. I've prayed that so many times in faith. And you know what? It worked. I came through the situation. Whatever the obstacles were that got out of the way, got out of the way. I don't even understand fully how it happened. Now, psychologically, and I apologize for stepping aside here for a second, but psychologically, science says that 90%, at least 90% of the problems we worry about never happen anyway, is that our mind is so geared towards picking up all the problems of why things won't work that sometimes we focus on it so largely, but there's left just 10%. 10% of the problems that are, actually are issues in your life, that's all you have to deal with. Of the things that you worry about, just 10% is all you got to worry about. And God says... If you speak faith over them, tell those obstacles to move, they're going to have to get out of your way. That makes the job so much easier on our side of things. Okay. So you can almost hear the inflections in Peter's voice when he said, The fig tree you cursed is withered away. And I'm sure it communicated surprise and disbelief when Jesus replied to Peter. It's probably, and it wasn't probably in a monotone voice, it was more like, Peter, what's wrong with you? And what's wrong with us when we won't speak to our circumstances and tell them to get out of our way? Jesus was amazed at his unbelief. He was saying, it shouldn't shock you to see this fig tree withered. Have faith in God. He went on to explain that it wasn't limited to a fig tree. He used mountains in his example, but I believe you could apply it to anything. He was making the point that if we say with our mouths and believe in our hearts, we can have what we say. He also made it very clear who qualified to use words in this way. He said, whosoever uh, shall say, you are a whosoever. The Bible says, whosoever shall believe on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior shall be saved. You're that whosoever. The same thing that applied for us asking God to, to save us applies for us speaking to mountains, speaking to situation, and speaking faith in our own lives. So, <clears throat> so you are a whosoever because, uh, because you are, and if you're breathing, then you're qualified. Your words can affect the natural as well as the spiritual world. And I'm going to touch on that before we close today if we, if we get there. Jesus used the word say or saith three times in verse 23. He was making it clear that words have power, but he also said to have faith in God. The words have power are words that are filled with faith, and it is important to understand the faith they're filled with is not your human faith. This isn't, I, I hope it's not going to rain tomorrow. This is, hey, you know what? We've got an outreach, and uh, we've got to reach these people for Christ. In Jesus' name, we're just going to have that hope that it's not going to rain tomorrow. That's the same sentence, but one has faith and one doesn't. Do you understand the difference? Is one, there's a purpose behind it, there's a power behind it, and there's a passion behind it. And sometimes in faith, sometimes you do have to shout at your mountain, and sometimes you can just look at it by faith and boldness and just say, you move. And you use it, you activate something in your spiritual man that all of a sudden accesses and influences the world around you. And it's real. Uh, Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So, uh, talking about the, uh, the, the translation here, I'm aware the NIV says faith in the Son of God, but when you study this out, it becomes very clear He's talking about the very faith of God that He placed in you when you were born again. In fact, you can't even be born again by your own faith. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by the Word, and 1 Peter 1, 23 says, says that you are born again by the Word of God. So if you can't even believe for salvation with our human faith, how could we possibly use it for other things like healing or prosperity? But yet a lot of times I think Christians try to use just their natural faith, their human faith of, I hope it's not going to rain tomorrow. Oh, I, I hope I can pay my bills later. That's not faith. So... <clears throat> It's super important that you understand this. If you don't know this, you'll always, look, always be looking for others to pray for you, which is okay, and a lot of Christians are there, but if you want to reign victorious in your Christian life that you now have, 
you're going to have to learn how to pray for yourself and pray over your situations and things like that. And it's even good sometimes to get in agreement with other believers and have them get in agreement with what you're praying for. And there's faith added to the situation even. The Bible talks about how, and we're going to talk about in just a moment, we have a measure of faith that God has given us, just a measure. Jesus even says, if you even had faith as small as a mustard seed, and those things are like salt and pepper, they're tiny little granules. But that's enough faith that God has given us to access the spiritual realm and influence the world around us. So, if you have other people pray for you all the time, then you'll think that you always, uh, that other people have more faith than you do. And because of that, God will act on your behalf when they pray. This is wrong, and this is the reason many Christians are looking to man instead of to God for answers. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say, through grace it is given to me that every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than, highly than he ought uh, to think, but think soberly according to God, has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And I added that underline there. Think, think of it as using a ladle to dish up soup. If you use the same ladle every single time, and God did, every person will get the same amount of soup. It's the measure of soup. You've been given, it's a strange explanation, but I hope you understand it. You've been given the measure of faith. No born-again believer has more faith than any other. Some just do a better job of appropriating what they've been given. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the very word of God which we'll touch on here in a little while, so that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. The Scripture is not being symbolic. God actually created everything in existence with His words. He really did. Even science has uh, proved that out, although not for this reason. We're going to touch on that here in a minute. Um, he spoke creation into existence, and the substance of His faith manifested into what we see now. The Word of God has unlimited power. Each word is like a little capsule filled with faith, waiting for us believers to release it into our hearts and speak it out with our mouths. So uh, you sitting here and, and listening to the Scriptures, you listening to pastors teaching, you listening to um, uh, TBN or KSBJ or whatever you do to help build yourself out uh, outside of here even, you spending time with God and in prayer, that's you building up your faith, exercising that muscle. And the more that you know that you're hearing from God, it makes your faith that much stronger that all of a sudden that circumstance and situation or the heavy burden and weight comes on you. You can just use that muscle of faith and just throw it right off. And that's what we're doing here. That's what we're, we're learning and studying, what's available to us, and it's already ours. It doesn't even have to wait for you to understand this. I don't even uh, know if you ever noticed, whenever you see a, a, a new baby Christian, Every single prayer they pray, they're telling everybody, I prayed for this and it happened. I prayed for this and it happened. And I prayed for this and it happened. I, I know a baby Christian over in Ireland, he's like, uh, I was just trying to cross the street and the, the, I kept missing the lights and people kept running the lights and I just said, God, I need to be able to cross the street, change the lights. And all of a sudden he said, the lights changed. Everyone stopped. He was able to cross the street. And he says, is it okay to pray that sort of thing? I said, absolutely. You know why? It's training ground. It's training wheels on you that you know that you can exercise these things and you can learn how when you pray, God will answer you. Your faith interacts with the natural world and you change circumstances. Yes, it is perfectly fine to pray for the small things. Jesus says, pray about all things. And so when you realize that even baby little prayers that don't even really seem to mean much to you, it's still you exercising your faith. Okay. Where are we at here? <clears throat> Lost my place here. Sorry about that. Um, so everything we see was created by words. It is the very word of God that holds the universe together. Um, Hebrews 1.3, therefore... Everything we see will respond to faith-filled words. They have to respond because words are the parent force. Now, I know in, in, in a programming sense, and I apologize if I get a little geeky on you for, for a second here, but when you're programming, uh, usually you have to be a certain level of access when you program something. If you try to program something that's outside of your access, the program will let you actually do it. It'll give you an error and you get you know, feedback and all of a sudden you can't do what you're trying to do. Now, uh, on operating systems, if you're using Windows and different things like that, you do it as a user with a certain amount of privilege. And if you're you and you're in your account, you can do anything that you need to to do. Now, I say this because God programmed this entire universe with His level of access. He is the most high authority in the whole universe. He made everything we see that we think is so real. It's His. He made it. And then He gave us access into His privileges. And so through Christ Jesus, not of our own power, not of our own ability, but through Christ Jesus, we can access the same authority 
and the same benefits that God spoke the whole universe into existence, we can speak over our own bodies and say, you know, be healed in Jesus' name. Symptoms go in Jesus' name. Uh, uh, problems in your family go in Jesus' name. Why? Because you're accessing His authority. It's nothing to do with you even, except you see the situation and the problem in front of you, and you have the ability to access His authority, speak it out, and have things change around you. Now, again, this all has to line up with His Word. You can't go to the first person you say and go, uh, in Jesus' name, you're going to give me that Lexus. I'm accessing God's authority. No, that's not what it's there for. But you can say, hey, you know what, Lord? A Lexus will really bless me. And maybe I can even get one and maybe even give it away. And, you know, maybe I can bless other people with it. And all of a sudden, you're accessing faith for a different reason. And then it's for the kingdom of God that ultimately gets blessed. And you can put a big old Christian bumper sticker on the back of it. Absolutely. God will bless those things. And I know people that it actually worked for. The, the pastor over in Ireland, I know the, the church we were at in Grace Fellowship, uh, the whole church got together and bought him a brand new Mercedes, top of the line, luxury model. And he got so much criticism because all the, all the surrounding community thought, oh, look at that, see, he's top of the line Mercedes. Yeah, tell me he's not stealing money away from those people. You know what he did? He went to uh, one of the people in his church who was uh, uh, the owner of the workshop was uh, trying to witness to and, and lead him to the Lord, gave him a brand new Mercedes. Immigrant over from Poland, didn't have much of anything, didn't have a car, getting lifts from everywhere, gave him a brand new top of the line Mercedes. The pastor took his own money, bought himself a Land Rover. All the community couldn't talk about anything anymore because everybody heard what he did. It brought glory to the kingdom of God all of a sudden. And one little uh, uh, soon-to-be believer, he got born again and spirit-filled later on, got blessed by the kingdom of God. That's what faith is for, to be able to, to access and influence the world around us. So, so uh, Proverbs 23, 7 says, uh, As you think in your heart, so are you. Luke 6, 45 says, If you speak, if what you speak comes from the abundance of your heart, uh, in other words, the way that you think controls the way that you talk, and if you understand the words, that your words have power, then you understand why you can be hung by your tongue. Now, again, it's not a legalism thing, but it's sometimes we trip ourselves up. Uh, I don't know about you, but anytime I'm, I'm talking to somebody and I'm trying to explain circumstances I had in the past or symptoms, the, the, the migraines I deal with from time to time, I use the wrong words and all of a sudden I'm confessing. Oh, yeah, when it hits me, man, it hits me hard and this happens and this happens. Well, you, don't you know that later in the day all of a sudden I start feeling bad? All of a sudden that migraine kind of starts tickling my brain and so, oh, you know, you, you, you confessed it earlier, it's coming to pass. Well, you know, when, I, when that happens, I have to catch myself and you say, you know what? In Jesus' name, I must try to stop saying that over myself about this migraine and that migraine, and it's going to do this to me. And I start trying to confess the right things. Does it work? Sometimes. And other times, no. Sometimes I have to get my wife to pray for me. But I know, and sometimes I've took the, the powerful tablets, it's the top-of-the-line stuff, the doctor says this will take care of it, and it wouldn't even hit the migraine, wouldn't even touch it, wouldn't even take it away. But my wife's next to me finally had enough and said, can I just pray for you real quick? lay her sweet little hands on my head, and within five minutes, that headache, that migraine is gone. I'm in absolute agony for 90% of the day, and all of a sudden, my wife pay, prays for me, and it's gone. Why? Faith. Faith has more ability to access and influence things around you than sometimes medicine does, sometimes more than doctors can. You have to use your faith. So, <clears throat> the only reason that every one of us isn't dead from the many idle words we have spoken is because we haven't believed every word that comes out of our mouth. Thank God for that. Thank God our words have to be mixed with faith, and we have to believe them from our hearts, but this should help us see a powerful truth that we're going to believe if we're going to be sick, uh, sorry, if we believe we're going to be sick or we believe that uh, they will always be poor or when you confess things from your mouth and we get what we believe. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it up and down the highway. In Highway 45, we, we talked about it as we are passing. There's a big illuminated billboard with the countdown clock. Hurricane season is coming! And then the days, the hours, and the minutes before that first hurricane. It's like they're trying to get you in faith. Believe with us. This hurricane's coming. I looked at that thing and said, in Jesus' name, no hurricane is going to affect us. Every single time. They try to put these things in front of you, and all of a sudden you're accessing something. Even a natural way, you're all of a sudden kind of, oh, yeah, well, you know, it, it kind of comes around this year every single time. And, yeah, I remember a couple of years ago that bad storm was here, and all of a sudden they're getting you in faith. Hurricane season, the you know, same thing comes, you look on uh, uh, Walgreens or Walmart or CVS website sometimes, flu season, come get your shot now before it's too late. You know, all these messages and billboards, they're trying to just put it in front of you that this is an issue that you need to deal with now or, you know, get in faith with us, get in agreement with us. You know, your faith needs to interact more with your world, your health, and your situation 
than what the world uh, is trying to get you to interact with. I'm teaching the same thing with the kids, the things that you listen to, the music, the television, the movies, is trying to speak to you certain things. But as a Christian, what you focus on, what you put in your heart, is going to end up coming out of your mouth. And that's what the scripture is talking about, is if you put this in front of your mouth and this in front of your heart, uh, in front of your eyes all the time, what you're accessing is going to start coming out of your mouth. And we don't even know why it happens sometimes. Anyway, so on the other hand, what happens when we take faith-filled words of God, plant them in our hearts where they can take root and grow, everything changes. No longer are we just saying, I believe that I'm healed or I'm prosperous, but we believe it, and the faith of God is then released through those words. I told it before, and I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, when I was going through Bible school, I had a sore throat that morning. I'm back in the sound booth, and I'm running everything for Pastor James right before his class starts. We got a scripture test, and I got 10 minutes to study, and I didn't study. I was going to college full-time. I was doing a full-time job, and I was doing Bible school full-time. I did that for three and a half, four months, and I was going crazy. But I had a sore throat, and these symptoms were on me, but the scripture we were learning was Isaiah 53, 5. By his stripes we were healed. And so I'm just confessing that again and again and again in my natural faith because I'm just trying to get it up in my brain. And all of a sudden I kind of felt something as I kept saying those words about by his stripes I was healed. By his stripes I was healed. All of a sudden something dropped from here. I can physically feel it. All of a sudden it just kind of hit my heart. And I'm, as I'm speaking these things out, by his faith I'm healed. By his faith. And all of a sudden it's by, uh, by his stripes I'm healed. All of a sudden I, I felt it hit here and it's like I could feel something warm going to my, in my throat and the, the sore throat left immediately. What happened? Sometimes when you take this word, even if you don't fully realize what it's trying to teach you, and you confess it and you speak it over yourself, eventually it's going to sink down into your heart. Your heart's going to go, yes, I can use this. We need this. Access it. And all of a sudden that healing anointing, that uh, change of situation you're believing for will, will happen. Now, is that just an easy example that I can come up with the top of my head? But so many times in situations, uh, dealing with health, dealing with finances, dealing with just about everything, I've had to do these things. And I know you have as well. This Christian life we have, we have to access this faith. We have to speak these things, and we have to believe what God said. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here learning even more. So, uh, here we are. Uh, Proverbs eighteen twenty one: Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. It not only says life and death as well, but it's sad to say most of the words being communicated today are negative words, words that do not bring about abundant life and cause more problems. So words are not simply sounds caused by air passing through our larynx. Words have real power. God spoke the world into being by His power, uh, by His words, Hebrews 11.3, and we are in His image in part because of the power we have with words. Words do more than convey information. The power of our words can actually destroy one's spirit, stir up hatred or violence, and they also uh, incite wounds and inflict them directly. Of all the creatures on the planet, only man has the ability to communicate through spoken word. The power to use these words is a unique and powerful gift from God. Now, uh, I'll touch on this because I don't know how much more we're going to uh, to get to today. I've only got about 10 minutes left. Um, I, I mentioned this before, but this is an actual fact. Science... Years ago, I think it was in 1995, I tried to get the exact source, but they've done their best to try to eradicate where the original source was. But it was in Scientific America. There was an article published when they actually broke up the smallest particle in existence. Now, you know, there's molecules and there's atoms and there's electrons and neutrons. And, and the smallest particle of matter at the moment that science was talking about was called a quark. And basically, a quark is a particle that makes up other particles. It's the smallest thing that exists. And science for years has been wondering, and they've been looking through electron microscopes and through uh, uh, super colliders and trying to break up particles to see what's inside. Well, when they finally opened up the quark, they found out that it was made up of vibration, of sound. They didn't understand what it meant. They still don't understand what it meant. They've been theorizing it ever since, and they tried to change it immediately because as soon as they published the article, Christians who know what the Word says, in the beginning God said, and it was, have known from the very beginning of the Bible that the Bible has actually said that by the very power of God's words, everything was spoken into existence. So as soon as Christians jumped onto it, they immediately changed it and they said, okay, well, it's, it's, it's not a sound, it's a vibration. Uh, something has to be vibrating. Uh, uh, a string, we'll just call that string whatever, we'll name it later. Okay, it's now a string theory. So they're, they're trying to get it further away from what actually is happening, but all they know is that everything is made up of sound and vibrations and they don't understand it. 
but the very essence of everything that exists is based on words, God's words. So you as a Christian, you have to realize that, yes, you have the natural ability to uh, uh, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You have the natural ability to confess negative things or positive things over yourself, and psychologically you might be able to influence yourself. But the Christian living, the Christian life that God has given you is something that when you speak your words and connect with what His words say and your faith gets involved, all of a sudden your words can change the world around you. The mountain can move. You can drive the fig tree. You can say to your, your uh, symptoms and sickness, you know, go in Jesus' name. you be healed. And it's going to have to obey you. Why? Because when creation hears His voice coming out of your mouth, it has to obey. When I talked about programming a little while ago, it's because we're accessing His level of authority through our mouth for the right reasons. So, uh, where are we at here? Um... So, though it's a gift, our words have the ability to destroy and the power to build up, Proverbs 12, 6 says. The writer of Proverbs tells us the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who will love it will eat its fruit, Proverbs 18, 21. Are we using words to build people up or to destroy them? Are they filled with love or hate or bitterness or blessing, complaining or compliments, lust or love, victory or defeat? Like tools, they can be used to help us reach our goals or send us spiraling into depression. Furthermore, our words not only have the power to bring death or life into this world, but in the next as well. Jesus says, I tell you uh, that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. By your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned, Matthew 12, 36 to 37. But words are important. We've already talked about that. It's not about legalism. Words are important, so we're going to have to live to give an account one day when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, he wrote, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others to, uh, according to their needs, and it will be a benefit to those who listen. Uh, Ephesians 4.29. I know a, a brother in Christ uh, I used to work with at uh, one of the churches, and he was a brilliant sound engineer, brilliant musician, couldn't stop cursing to save his life. Every single word out of his mouth, even if he was talking to the pastor, there would be a blankety-blank and a blankety-blank. He just got in such a habit of cursing. And the very nature of the definition of a word is a negative word, a curse. You're speaking something negative over yourself, over someone else, over a situation. And he, he argued with me one day. He says, oh, it, uh, God understands how I am, and, you know, he accepts me. And I say, so you pray to God? God, blankety, blankety, blank, blank, I believe in blankety, blank, blank, this is going to blankety. And he said, yeah, I, I do. I said, do you get the answer to that prayer? <laughs> you know? And I said, the Bible actually says, can bitter water and sweet water come out of the same, same fountain? And is that as soon as you got sweet water and bitter water, it mixes, you end up with bitter water that might have a sweet taste. It, it doesn't have the same effect. Uh, as a Christian, will God listen to his prayer? Absolutely. But when he's speaking negative at the same time and trying to engage faith, it's a bit like a, a, a motor in a car kind of sputtering and dying like it's got bad gas in it. You might be getting somewhere, but you're not getting there as efficiently as you need to be. And so um, let's go ahead and jump down here. Let's see how much time we got left. Uh, jump over to uh, page 27. Christians are people whose hearts and minds and lives have been changed by the power of God already. Through salvation, through uh, repentance, and through baptism, they can all of a sudden get themselves on a life and a course that is going to help improve everything around them. Uh, but remember, before we were saved, we were in spiritual death. Ephesians 2, uh, 1 through 3 says, Paul describes... Those who are dead in sin, their throats are open graves. Romans 3, 13 says, Our words are full of blessings when the heart is full of blessings. So when our hearts are full of the love of Christ, only truth and purity can come out of our mouth. Peter says, uh, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord, and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3, 15 says, let the power of our words be used for God to manifest the power of our faith. Be prepared to give a reason for why we love the Lord. Now, if we're blankety-blank and cursing all the time, it can be kind of hard for someone to actually really want to know why we're different. Oh, he's not different. He sounds just like me. Um, be prepared to give a, a reason for why we love the Lord at any time to anyone. Our words should demonstrate the power of God and His grace and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of our lives. May God enable us to use our words as an instrument of His love and saving grace. So, um, 
Yeah, so I mentioned before that some of the lessons I've done with the youth and talking about some of the scientific things, uh, the very point is that every Sunday school kid knows that the creation, every single thing in existence was actually formed by the power of God's words. And if you realize that, yes, we were created in His image and likeness, and yes, those very words are uh, uh, what's actually causing molecules to form a, a pulpit here, and the chairs that you're sitting on, and the air that we breathe came from the very Word of God. It came from His faith. It came from His power. And now we, as Christians, have access to that authority. You know, the, the, I talked about this before. The whole world is looking for supernatural stuff. It's on the movies. It's on the Internet. It's on TV. It's on supernatural stuff or this magic stuff or this power stuff. But as Christians, this is something we actually have access to, and it's not spooky. It's kind of awesome. You see somebody hurting, and all of a sudden, you have an answer. His name is Jesus. You go and you lay your hands on him and say, in Jesus' name, be healed. And from the least of the greatest, from the least of the greatest of us, it has to work, and it will work. But you just have to engage your faith. I told you before about uh, the brother of the Lord. Now his name's Patty over in Ireland, and uh, yeah, he's Patty the Irishman. And he kind of came into the church every once in a while for a cup of tea. I don't. Did you, did you ever have a chance to meet Patty? You met Patty? Okay. Uh, he, he'd come over to the church every once in a while for a cup of tea. And at, at first, it was like he just wanted some, you know, free biscuits and a cup of tea. Maybe he ran out of tea at his own house and really wanted a cup. The Irish, the British are addicted to their tea. I am too. It's good. But anyway, so Patty would show up every once in a while, and he'd, oh, do you mind if I have a cup of tea, you know, and I just want a cup of tea. And he'd sit in the back of the church, but he'd come over on Wednesday nights, or uh, sorry, Tuesday nights and uh, Thursday nights, and that's when our Bible school was on in the evenings. And so uh, he'd be sitting in the back of the class. He'd be hearing about, hearing about faith. He'd be hearing about uh, authority of the believer. He'd be hearing about uh, uh, the power of healing in a Christian life. And so he heard these things, and he kind of just filed them away, I guess. And while he was at the doctor, for his own reasons, his own situations he was going through, there was a sister, uh, a, a, a woman sitting right next to him, and she says, I've been in pain 20 years. I've been on morphine all this time, and the pain just is constant, won't go away, and the morphine's not doing anything. I'm here to the doctor to, to see what we can do about it. And she says, he's like, are you in pain now? And she goes, yeah. Well, all of a sudden, Patty's gears, I guess, are turning in his head, all that cups of tea kind of doing some work, I guess, and it interacted with some faith, and all of a sudden, Patty says, can I pray for you? And she goes, well, yeah, that'd be nice. And so Patty reached over and grabbed her hand, and he says, well, in Jesus' name, let this pain go, and let the healing of God uh, intersect her life or uh, influence her in her life. And, and he prayed for her, and he just said, in Jesus' name, amen. He, kinda, he said he felt awkward. He didn't know what happened. She just kind of just oh, kind of, okay, thank you. And then she got quiet, and he got quiet. He ended up getting called up first. He went to the doctor, and uh, 10, 20 minutes after he got out of the doctor, uh, she grabbed his hand as he was about to leave. And she says, the pain is gone. Thank you for praying for me. Patty, when he caught me and my wife, Juliet, we were just going to the church uh, for one of the Wednesday night service. And he says, I, I got to tell you this. I got to tell you this. I prayed for somebody. And he told us the whole story. And all of a sudden, this was a man who was raised in religion, was raised as a Catholic, was raised to believe that God's out to get you. But all of a sudden, he's also been hearing that as a Christian, you have the ability to speak and pray and change people's lives and, and your own life around you just by speaking faith. And if it'll work for Brother Patty, God bless his, his heart, and, and just hearing a little bit of Bible school teaching, it'll work for us. If it works for, for uh, Benny Hinn or any uh, great man of God that you can possibly think of, the same measure is inside of you. You just have to access it. Okay, we're going to go ahead and stop there for today. We'll pick up with uh, the next lesson next week. Thank you very much.